All right, guys, our next guest somehow didn't age 100 years when he was stuck for a month in the drinking smoking area on Yas Island. The man that could possibly uh, cure all illnesses due to cigarette smoke and one of the best guys in the game, John Morgan. Welcome to Submission Radio. It's been a while, man, and you go from one hotel to another over there at the Contender Series Hotel right now. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. I get out of Fight Island and, uh, and I make it home, and after a couple of days, I'm already back in another hotel quarantining once again. But, uh, man, this is going to be the routine for, like, the next two months. I'll be, I'll be doing this quarantine thing. Uh, twice a week, man. You think about it. We got Contender Series on Tuesdays. We got the fight nights on Saturdays, um, and the UFC is is keeping that that safety protocol high. So it's a uh, it's a crazy life, but man, it's a uh, it's a uh, you know just a weird time for everybody. So I'm just blessed to be to be working. Just out of curiosity, how's it feel to be back in the US after the crazy month over in Yas Island? And uh, if you could sort of summarize what just what that month was like, you know, I imagine it would have been kind of like Groundhog Day and just, you know, stuck on an island, stuck in essentially a hotel room. But also, you know, you did some fun things over there. They, they did jet skiing and stuff like that. Yeah, no, honestly, man, it was a really memorable experience. I mean, the first week was like the most intense, right? Because that's the week where we're trying to figure out like what's going on and how are they doing this and really monitoring the safety protocol and you know all that craziness you know if you if you saw some of the scenes i mean we get greeted with people in full hazmat suits mm. you know and they're spraying us down with with sanitizing solutions as we get off the bus i mean it's just it was a wild scene and you know that so that first week was really intense kind of getting into everything we had the 48 hour quarantine to deal with uh so all that was really interesting then the second week was just nuts because there were two fight nights uh you know that that week with the midweek event so it was literally like media day uh, weigh-ins and then fights and media day weigh-in fights. It was great because we got to do the in-person media days, which is awesome, man, because, you know, we, we've been doing these virtual media days, which just aren't quite the same, you know, so we got to do these in-person interviews, which was awesome. But the third week, man, yeah, at that time, Groundhog Day is exactly right. We did finally get a couple days off, so that's when we did get to go out and have a little fun, you know, check out the, 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 uh, the, the racetrack there, mm. you know, the jet skis, like you said, I got that some fun. But at that point, like, you know, once you had a little time to yourself. That's when you, you started missing home a little bit and just thinking, man, I'm, I'm ready to get there. You know, obviously I've, I've got a wife and a kid at home and, and, and was missing them. So amazing, uh, blessed to, to go cover the event. You know, it's it so interesting to see, man, just the level that the UFC and the Abu Dhabi government went to, to create that bubble. It really kind of raised your understanding of like what it takes to get this done. And, and now we're seeing some of the failures in the other sports leagues here in the United States, um, as well as the successes. I think the NBA is doing a great job. Um, but it, it was interesting, man. It was definitely kind of once in a lifetime stuff. I say once in a lifetime, I think we're going back in October. So <laughs> at least twice in a lifetime, maybe, uh, but it, but it, it, it was great, man. But I, I, I am happy to be back in Vegas for a little while, if nothing more than just see my kid for a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll tell you, it kind of reminds us a little bit of, uh, that UFC 200 weekend, uh, that we all did together where there was all those fight cards and you were going to one media day and then one way. And then, then that night had the other fight. That was happening so it must have been very similar tell me about the drinking situation though in the smoking area only has john morgan come back with a serious case of a cigarette addiction <laughs> yeah no listen uh, i'm not a cigarette <laughs> smoker but uh if, if there's a cigar around and i got a chance to maybe enjoy a fine cigar especially a cuban cigar like they're able to have <laughs> over there I might enjoy it a little bit, you know what I mean? So it was good. We, we had a little chance to get in the frosty beverages. Uh, I always say, man, when you go over there, they test you to make sure you want your frosty beverages because it's a good like 12 to 14 bucks for a for Whoa. a pint of beer. So it's uh, it's it's very, very expensive. Um, but we did find a spot. There was a, a it wasn't in our hotel, but it was in the hotel right next to us. There was a place that had two for one Peronis all day, every day. <laughs> I'm not even a big Peroni fan, but if you're going to sell it to me at two for one, uh, that'll be my go to. So we ended up sitting there. We had the same table every day. Uh, we basically just called it the office. You know, it had a it had a PowerPoint right now there we could plug into. And we could do our work from there there while we uh, enjoyed a quick frosty beverage everything closed at midnight though which was probably actually a, a good thing versus a bad thing because they they'd run you out at midnight but uh, it was nice we went there enough that they called me mr morgan as i arrived every day so it was all right <laughs> yeah now that you've left i think they're going to be out of business they'll have to close down the tourism <laughs> over there let me ask you this oscar i was obviously oscar willis from the mac life fantastic drinking companion we know that ourselves who are some of the other top guys that you were able to share a beer with over there? I know that you guys were able to have a little bit of downtime. 
Yeah, no, Oscar Willis was fantastic. Uh, Scott Peterson from MMA Weekly, he doesn't drink, but uh, he actually came and just hung out for a little bit and talked a little bit um, and met some of the local journalists as well, you know, which was which was interesting. Uh, you know, some uh, some British and some Irish folks that had relocated over to uh, to Dubai and Abu Dhabi. And so we got to kind of pick their brains a little bit. Um, they weren't used to kind of going quite as hard as we did. So they, 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 they didn't necessarily take it through on multiple nights in a row. Uh, but uh, but no, there were some good people as well. So it was fun to kind of pick their brain. And it's crazy. You know, I talk about the level that everybody went to to create this bubble. You know, we got there. We did a 48-hour quarantine. The locals, including the journalists that were covering it, had to do a 14-day quarantine. So they had to be in their rooms for 14 days in a row to help ensure the safety of this bubble. So um, pretty pretty wild stuff. Man, that's crazy. Um, all right, now now that we're, we're back and now we can actually talk some MMA with you, John, which we've been dying to do, uh, there's a few things to talk about. First of all, we just wanted to touch on, obviously, Derek Brunson. He put in an impressive win over Edmund Shabazian uh, this past weekend, putting himself in, in a good, fun spot, uh, a good, fun fight for him next. But the fans were, the, the focus was sort of on the Herb Dean's uh, stoppage in the fight and his performance and I guess it's been a bit of a rough time for Herb Dean lately just curious what did you think of Herb's uh, decision in that in that fight the way he handled it yeah you know what to be honest with you I actually kind of liked it a little bit I mean I Ooh. think there's an argument to be made that you could have stopped it at the end of round two especially that last shot right at the bell right it seemed it seemed like Edmund may have been out briefly um, but he popped back up he walked to his corner Herb, Herb, Herb watched him um, brought the doctor in um, I do kind of echo uh, Dana White's criticisms of the doctor. Um, and it was, we saw one in Fight Island as well, where the doctor just walks in and goes, are you okay? Like, what kind of evaluation? Mm. I, I'm not a doctor, but man, I, I want to <laughs> see like some, some questions and, you know, break out the little light thing to check the pupils or mm -hmm. whatever. I mean, I want to see a little bit more <laughs> inspection. So I'm, I'm no, you know, doctor, like I said, so maybe I'm overstepping my bounds to criticize, but I feel like you could have done more. But what I like what Herb did was he said, look, I'm going to give you the 60 seconds to recover, but I'm going to have a short leash. And he did. I mean, if you look at the stoppage, had that stoppage in the third round occurred at any other point in the fight, you'd go, oh, my God, what is Herb doing, man? He's stopping this way too early. But what he did was he said, look, I'm going to give this gentleman an opportunity to go out there and, and, and take something back. But if he can't, I'm going to keep a short leash. So I, I honestly uh, re really didn't have a, a, a problem with the way Herb Dean handled that uh, at all. Again, maybe an argument that you could have stopped it at the end of round two. Maybe an argument that the corner shouldn't have sent him out for round three. Um, but I like the fact that basically as soon as Edmund was back in trouble in round three, uh, Dean called it off. Mm. I mean, we all saw what happened with Dan Hardy and Herb the previous week. I'm just, guessing, I'm just wondering, were you there and how do you recall it all going down from your perspective? And I guess the big question is sort of what was going through your mind as it was going down? Because that would have been a very surreal sort of moment for you if you were there to see it happen yeah. live. It was interesting because I was actually in the in the uh, in the media tent at that. Well, I guess it's not really a tent there. It's just in the media room, I guess. Um, but I so we we could hear the audio, but I didn't get to see it physically until those photos came out. Basically, since I'm there, since I was at Fight Island by myself, as you guys know, you you know you want to collect that video footage of the winners. Um, being cage side is great, but we're not collecting the footage that we need to, to you know for the website. Um, so I basically only got to go out for the first fight and the main event of, of every single night. Um, so I was in the back, but I heard the audio. In fact, we have a house feed uh, there in the media room. So uh, when a lot of the, 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 the broadcasts are going to commercial, we can still hear everything. Um, and you could definitely hear the, the conversation on an open mic. Um, but it was interesting, you know, and, and, and I had a chance to speak to, to Herb Dean um, in the airport afterwards on, on the way back. Um, listen, you know, definitely understand the, the, uh, the concern around the stoppage. You know, it's funny because, you know, a lot of people say that, you know, Dan said right away, okay, that was two tonight. You know, the Tanner Bowser one, I didn't really have that much problem with. I mean, yeah, there were, there were 10 punches, but if you go back and watch it, um, they, they all went to the arm. Um, you know, the Jai Herbert stoppage, I, I definitely understand it. Um, I, I think people are being a little too, too hard on Herb Dean, if I'm being honest. Um, but the thing that initially I thought was, you know, Dan Hardy's kind of being out of place by doing this on the broadcast. And I think the UFC and, and Dana White has said, said as much. I think even Dan has kind of admitted maybe I overstepped my bounds. Um, but, and it was a point that actually Oscar Willis brought up when we were recording uh, the post-fight show for the MMA Roadshow, who went and started talking to who. And when you go back and, and, and ask, it sounds like Herb Dean actually walked over to Dan Hardy. So at that point, I think you got to mm. get Dan Hardy a little bit of I don't want to say a pass completely because again he's on the broadcast he should be worried about that um, but it sounds like Herb walked over to him because Dan was was in his broadcast position so um, I think that 
you know, people that maybe went after Dan a little hard at first should maybe back off a little bit and say, well, I mean, if the, if the guy approached him, that kind of gives you a little bit of a, of a free leash to speak your mind, even if perhaps you shouldn't. What do you think of this rule where if anybody, like Dana was saying at the press conference and he was kind of targeting Dan where he was like, if anybody ever does anything like that, speaks to an official or, you know, gets out of line, uh, they're essentially fired. And I, I agree with you that people were going a little bit hard for after Dan, just given his position as a former fighter, as a guy who I think his heart was in the right place. And a lot of people were saying, you know, they were jumping on the whole thing of, oh, that's just unprofessional of, of Dan. And um, I guess you can debate it, but as, as far as like what he was going for, I think he deserves a little bit of credit, you know, like having a word with someone isn't the end of the world, even if it's a fired up word. And it's not like the fight was going on anymore. The fight was done, you know, I think it would have been a lot worse if Dan tried to do that like mid fight. Yeah, no, no, listen, I think Dan Hardy's heart's in the right place. I mean, I've always been a fan of Dan Hardy as a fighter, as a person, man. He's always been a, a gentleman and, and was fun to cover in his fighting days and is a great analyst, man. His, his breakdowns are so in-depth. And his heart was definitely in the right place. So completely understand the the, the passion behind what he was doing. And I, I, you can't fault him for that at all. Like you said, I mean, you can fault him for speaking during the broadcast. I mean, you're supposed to be broadcasting i mean that's your focus at that point you know what i mean that's what you're being paid to do um, mm. um and if you want to have a conversation with her being afterwards i mean we're all stuck in the same especially especially on fight island we're all stuck in the same area we get all stuck in the bubble i mean you're gonna cross paths with them um and, and i'm sure he could reach out to him personally but i understand dana's uh you know position on this as well i mean you can't have members of your staff anybody even if it's broadcasters um, regardless of whether former fighters are not going and talking to these officials, the officials, um, you know, because then it starts to get into, well, you know, when does, is it okay to just verbalize? And then what if that turns into something physical or what if somebody feels verbally attacked or whatever? You can't do that. That's what Mark Ratner and, and, and that team is there to do. So completely understand Dana's position. I mean, look, it's no different. I'm, I'm going to be in Philadelphia next week uh, calling fights for Cage Fury Fighting Championships along with, with CM Punk. And it's, it's no different there. I mean, they would not want me – uh, going up and speaking to the officials in, in the middle of it. A, I've got my broadcasting duties going on. B, um, you know, those officials are there to do a job, and it, it's not really your position to talk to them. Now, to speak up about them? Absolutely, man. If, if Dan Hardy wants to be on that broadcast and say, man, I just don't understand this. I, I feel this was a bad... I mean, that's what he's there to do. It's just to not necessarily directly address them at the time, and I think that's what, you know, kind of Dana White was saying, and I think Dan's admitted as, as much as well since. But again, I'll go back to the point that it sounds like Herb walked over to Dan Hardy, so mm. you kind of, I don't want to say you give him a pass at that point, but you kind of got to go, well, if the guy speaks to you first, I mean, it, it, you know, maybe you should be the bigger man and say, hey, we'll do this at a later date. But I think that takes a lot of the onus off of you at that point. Mm. I feel like you and CM Punk should go to the ring and do a double suplex to the referee if something <laughs> goes out of line. Take it to the next step. You know, double, double, double pipe bump. Let me, let me ask you this. I mean, you've been in the game for such a long time. Do you remember a time where you've really had to hold your tongue from a terrible referee performance? You would have seen so many of them. Any stand out to you? You, you know, I mean, I can't recall specific instances right now, but I'll be honest with you. I've been cage side and yelled, stop the fight before. Um, and I know Herb came out and said that's irresponsible, but there have been situations where I did feel like somebody's, um, long-term health was on the line. You know, with Jai Herbert, I didn't feel that way. Um, I didn't feel like, oh, my God, what, what we're witnessing right now. Uh, you know, again, every punch to the brain has the potential uh, to cause long-term damage. But there have been instances where I thought, oh, you know, and it's, it's, it's almost instinctual. You know what I mean? It is. It, it's You see you have actual physical concern for, for somebody's health and well-being. So I, I don't necessarily blame Dan for, for doing that. It's just – you, you can't do it all the time. I mean, if you're if if you really feel again for somebody's safety and you fear for it, it, it kind of comes out. I've, I've I've done that before, to be honest with you. Not a lot, um, but I mean, I've been cage side for for thousands of fights. Um, but I, that, that those words have come out of my mouth before, and and, and I know as a as a, a media member sitting on press row, that is absolutely not my duty or my responsibility or it, what to be honest I should be doing. Um, but as a human being. Um, there have been very rare instances where I thought, oh, my God, that person is in serious danger uh, of potentially even, you know, losing their life. And, and I've yelled, stop the fight before. Um, I think that's just natural as a human being when you have care. And, and of course, Dan takes it to another level because um, he's, he has the experience of being in the cage. You know, he, he knows what it's like to be there. He knows what that feeling is. So, um, yeah, nothing specific stands out. But I'll be honest. I mean, I've I've found myself in that position before. Mm. Joe Rogan's done that a lot of times as well. So I think that part, someone yelling, stop the fight. I don't think that's really the end of the world. Um, but 
A name emerging from Yas Island, arguably the biggest name emerging from Yas Island, has obviously been uh, Hamza Shmaev. And after winning two fights, winning both back-to-back -back in two weight classes, absorbing almost zero punches, Dana White's obviously gearing up to put him on, you know, another event shortly. And uh, he seems super, super high on him, which is great. Is there a ceiling in your mind of how far he can go in the division for you? I guess when you see these new stars and guys that sort of captivate everybody, you you have one you, you have sort of one train of thought where it's like we need to rush this guy to a title shot, see him against the big sharks in the division because obviously you want to test him and that's exciting. And then the other thought is let's just slow this prospect down. Uh, unlike the UFC have done many many times, we just throw him in the in the deep end. Although in saying that, Derek Brunson made a very interesting point this past weekend about how you know in the NFL and the NBA, like there is no warm ups. When you're a pro, you're a pro. You're facing you know the best teams. It is what it is. So. Ha, ha, what is the the ceiling on Hazmat so far, um, based on what we saw? Yeah, listen, I honestly believe he's championship quality. I mean, when I see that, when I see his performances, and, and, and let me, and there's a lot more to it than just those two fights. I mean, first of all, you talk to the people that he trains with, you talk to the people as he was coming up. Uh, you know, I had posted a highlight video of him when he got assigned to the UFC that Ali Abdelaziz had given to me. Now, Ali Abdelaziz is one of the most passionate cheerleaders for his guys ever. You know, he'll tell you, you know, everybody's uh, great, but man, the level of excitement he had when I spoke to him about this kid, um, and then you start speaking to the people around him and they're just like, dude, you don't even understand. So, so you go, okay, all right, let me see what this is about. Um, so I can tell you the people around him have, it's, it's, it's a type of different faith than you hear about normal fighters, but then you watch his performances. Um, and I think he's the whole package. I mean, dude, he, he's, he's got the aggressive game. Uh, the, you don't waste time, you know, go out there, pressure, take you down, control, uh, you know, constant movement, constant uh, chaining submission attempts or chaining strikes and just keeping heavy in the position. And oh, by the way, you know, he's got knockouts on his record, too. He does have some hands, even though he didn't necessarily get to show them. So he's got that. He's got the drive. Um, he's got a little bit of a wit about him, too, which I think is fun. You know what I mean? His, his English is is broken English, but it's entertaining. You know, he comes in there and it's just, you know, I, I smash all in three in one night. What I mean, it's just He's fun, you know. And, and listen, I mean, you got to win fights, but you got to be a little bit marketable too. And I think he's got that going as well. But if I mean, we're just talking about pure skill set, yeah, I do believe he's got uh, you know championship quality uh, capabilities. Now, what we need to see is, and you talk about what you know, what uh, method you use with them. I mean, look, I, I do think it's clear that the guy's got. Uh, high potential, and he's going to need to face ranked opponents very soon. But you don't have to rush guys as well. You know, you can you can kind of work them up the ranks. I do want to see him against, say, you know, a, a, a guy with with D1 wrestling uh, background with heavy hands. You know, something like that. You know, is there somebody that's not going to get taken down? You know, quite that easily. Is there somebody that's going to? You know, it's it's the same reason, right? Why, why we're so excited to see Justin Gaethje and Habib Nurmagomedov, right? It's it's all about styles making fights. So we know what Hamza brings to the cage at this point. Now, to me, it's not necessarily what I like to see in the early development and in the early uh, as guys work their way up the ranks. It's not about names. It's about styles. I want to see tests. I got questions that I want to have answered. You know what I mean? I, I want to see that. You know, hey, can we put him against this kind of fighter? Can we put him against this kind of fighter? Can you know and, and answer all those questions? So to me, it's a it's a it's a hybrid. I mean, could the guy potentially? You know, could the guy be competitive against Kamaru Usman right now? Maybe. I mean, with the style he has, and, and maybe he is competitive against Kamaru Usman right now. But he doesn't need to be in that position right now, and obviously he hasn't earned it. Um, but on the flip side of it, it's clear that he does have talent. So to keep him at some kind of very, very low level, and let's just let's just you know let's keep signing new people to the to to to, to bring him in, or you know let's 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 let him uh, take somebody off the contender series every time. No, he needs to move up the ranks a bit. But to me, it's it's you know it's not about the names he's going to face; it's about the styles he's going to face and about the questions he's going to answer. And that's what I'm that's what I'm anxious to watch. Mm. And I guess the big question here is who's next? Do you have any names off the top of your head that you would like to see? I know some people are throwing out, you know, even names like a guy like Cowboy Cerrone and people like that, you know, big names that could build up his name value quickly. But then again, you mentioned it's about the styles. Yeah, you know, I don't, there's nobody that, that, that jumps out to me immediately. I mean, I guess it's all going to be about timing. I mean, obviously this pandemic area of MMA – it's really just about who's ready and who's available. It's not like, and, and that's been the biggest struggle for the matchmakers and off record. They'll tell you, I mean, it's just difficult. It's not like they have the whole roster available to them. I mean, when you, when you add in the fact that, you know, who can travel where, can they compete in the United States? You know, can they, do they have to wait for fight Island? And so even, the, even then when you work those things out, then it's like, okay, well, who's actually 
able to train right now or who isn't because of this COVID. I mean, so to me, it's hard. I mean, I, I, you know, the idea of, of a Cowboy Cerrone, I mean, that, listen, I, I think he could absolutely compete in, with, with Cowboy Cerrone. That, you know, that would be a big opportunity. But again, I don't think you have to rush him. Give him a little bit. I know it's, I know it was two impressive wins uh, in 10 days. I mean, that's amazing. Um, I, I don't know that you need to go that far up just yet. So uh, to me, it's, I guess it's really just about, you know, kind of who's available. But I, I, I'd like to see him against, I, I'd like to see him against somebody with a strong wrestling background, man. That's the next test I'd like to see. Somebody with a strong wrestling background that, you know, might be able to, to, to offer some resistance to those takedowns and, you know, not be on their back for, for four minutes and 55 seconds around. Hmm. What do you make of uh, the feud that's come between him and Conor McGregor sort of rather abruptly and quickly, you know, with uh, obviously Conor making the, the rat lip remarks and then comes up sort of, you know, making other memes about him, the, the, the story about how he apparently traveled to Ireland to beat up Conor McGregor. I almost feel like... Um, Conor McGregor's like tweets and who he who he takes aim at. It's kind of like precious currency, right? If Conor's tweeting at you or about you, it's a good thing. It's building your brand, um, and that's kind of the thing that's happened with uh, Hamzat here. It's it's kind of when was the last time somebody made their debut and they were in Conor's sites already, and obviously linking their names together, you know, creates a lot of headlines, a lot of articles, and just makes him you know an even bigger name. What do you think about the way that he's been trying to sort of bait Conor uh, into this uh, little feud? I think it's wise. I think it's smart. I think it, it gets you attention. Like I said, I think the guy's the, the whole package. I think he gets the, the marketing side of the game as well. And of course, you know, he's got the, the dominant MMA team behind him to kind of assist him in those efforts as well. But <laughs> I think this guy gets it himself. And and, uh, and I love it, man. I mean, and as you said, man, you know, Connor's attention is precious currency. What does that tell you if two fights in your UFC career, he's, he is willing to, to give you a little bit of attention. Tells me that he sees that's a, a, a next level talent as well. Um, you know, I don't think that's a fight that's going to materialize anytime soon. I mean, that's just not the, you know, the type of fight that Conor McGregor's going to want or the type of fight that the UFC would want. Um, so at the end of the day, I, I don't think it, you know, it really means anything in terms of getting a fight done. But I love it, man. You know what I mean? If you're going to come out firing, fire at the top, see what happens. You know what I mean? Just just throw it out there and see what sticks. And, and man, if he's willing to, to, to give you some attention back, that tells me you're doing something right. And it's, it's fascinating in the sense that, you know, this is a guy that fights so frequently. Who knows where he's going to be by the start of 2021? You know, it could be an Israel Adesanya situation where he's going for a title shot and has won all his fights and has fought, you know, four or five times. So it's obviously good for McGregor to keep his options open. But in terms of what's next for him, I, I guess Dana White keeps saying he's retired. It looks like you know, Conor McGregor won't be returning until maybe the end of this year or the start of next year. What do you sort of see McGregor's situation as like right now? And when do you think we'll see him back? And is there a fight out there right now for him that he could take, in your opinion? I mean, listen, there's fights he could take. I, I, I Look, I'm, I'm like everybody, I don't believe he's retired for good. You know, I, I just don't. Mm. I think he'll fight. Uh, you know, Dana came out and, and spoke with Barstool Sports earlier this week and said, you know, he's not going to fight in 2020. Um, but, you know, even he said eh, maybe 2021, though. You know, I think Connor would like to, uh, you know, I, I think Connor would like to fight in front of a crowd. Number one, I think, you know, for the gate revenue means something to the USC. And I think Connor would, would, would like that. I mean, I, I may be wrong, but, you know, when I think of him, I think of somebody that just feeds off that energy and that it's such a showman. And, to be honest, man, it would be a little bit disappointing to watch a Conor McGregor fight in the empty arena. I mean, I've, hmm. I've I've been in Jacksonville, I've been at the Apex, I've been on Fight Island, um, and 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 I love the fights. Um, and, and what I've said is is I've come to realize no crowd is actually pretty cool for the early fights. Like the 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 early fights, man, the sounds you get the you know you can really hear the depth of the blows. You can hear the the coaches you know, coaching him. And so to me, it actually enhances it. I love it. You don't got anybody booing. You don't got anybody yelling. You know, you, you ain't got the woos. You ain't got <laughs> anybody yelling, kick his ass, sea bass or whatever. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> I actually like it better. I actually like the atmosphere better. But when you get to the big fights, man, when you get to the the moments, you know, I, like the, the the buzz, you know, I think of, you know, the, the last event, uh, before we before we had to get rid of crowds with like you know uh, Wiley and uh, and Joanna and you're just like oh my god the the energy the electricity the atmosphere man that's missing and so you know while I, I you know obviously it's it's great anytime Conor McGregor fights because our our web traffic is up it, it helps you know obviously it's it brings attention to sport it's great man it would be a damn shame to kind of to to kind of not get that crowd so I, to be honest I think he probably feels that way too so you know I I, I would 
surprised if he doesn't fight till next year. And then there's, the other thing, too, is, you know, what fight really makes sense. I mean, of course, there's fights he can take. You know, you talk about, you know, the, the, the Poirier fight, I think, makes a lot of sense. You know, I think that would be a, a great one. Tony Ferguson is out there. You know, that was a discussion for a long time. Um, you know, you could, hell, you could even do a rematch with Max Holloway. It's, it's Max is it, kind of tied up right now, or in, you know, as far as where he's going to be in his immediate future. So there are fights out there, you know, clearly had Masvidal won. My God, that would be a, a massive fight. But I just don't think there's any fight right now where you look at and you go, that has to happen, and it has to happen right now. So, I, you know, I think a little bit of patience is is there, and, uh, and and I agree. I think right now, Dana, you know, it was right that Connor is retired, but temporarily speaking. Mm. It's interesting because I guess it's hard to imagine Khabib losing, and even though he's got this matchup with Justin Gaethje, which will be one of his hardest, um, people aren't really thinking about what would happen if Justin Gaethje beat Khabib because, I mean, he have a champion who's done so well for the company, a guy who's close to the end of his career. And we saw what happened with Max Holloway where he got that immediate rematch with Alex Volkanovsky. And then potentially, you know, Dana was saying, oh, maybe it's even an option to have a third fight. So my question to you is if Justin Gaethje beats Khabib, you know, could the UFC de deny him that immediate rematch, especially considering – he could be at the end of his career and deny that Gaethje Conor McGregor fight that I suppose McGregor's out there and waiting for the winner of that fight. Well, it's such an interesting scenario, right? It is funny how many people are talking about, you know, Habib's 30th fight. Like, hey, don't forget about Justin Gaethje in between, man. That dude's an absolute savage right now. And, and, and man, he, he is in form and I think um, has what it takes to potentially beat Habib. So do not look past Justin Gaethje. That's for damn sure. Um, I, I don't know. That, that's an interesting question. As far as would they give him the immediate rematch, knowing, you know, he, if he said, look, I want an immediate rematch, but I'm going to retire immediately to the fight. We know that's not ideal for the UFC, but at the same time, I, you know, I, I think the UFC and Dana especially, you know, they recognize what a star Habib is, what his global impact has been. I mean, man, you look at the partnership in Abu Dhabi and what happened in Fight Island. Not that they didn't already have an existing relationship, but you don't think that you know the 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 emergence of Habib as a, as a as a Muslim star has has played into that partnership uh, in recent years? Absolutely, man. That that man is a global superstar, and he's huge in that region. Um, so I could see the UFC saying, "Hey, listen, man, uh, it's not ideal for us, but 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 we'll do it." Because I mean, if they were willing to potentially do GSP, which I, I would love to see that fight, to be honest, I mean, I think that would be a great fight, GSP Habib for the 30th, if he's able to get by Gaethje. I mean, in that scenario, you're you're virtually guaranteeing that whoever wins the belt, if it's contested at lightweight, um, would be walking away. I mean, GSP already did it once. Don't don't tell me he wouldn't do it again. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'll be honest with you, man. I don't uh, I don't think Habib wants that Connor fight again, man. I, I I don't think he needs money. I don't think he cares about money. I don't think he wants the headaches. I, I could be wrong. But I feel like he cares more about principle and, and other opportunities. I mean, maybe they, they just throw out some insane amount of money that allows him to, you know, change the entire country of Dagestan. But um, I just I just I don't, I don't think he's really interested in that fight, if I'm being honest with you. Mm. It's it, yeah. GSP is like the king of the root and boot, you know. I'll catch you later, babe, and then and then he's off in an Uber. <laughs> um, but that I found that interesting because Dana White for a long time has been saying, you know, Conniverse could be Conniverse could be the rematch. We've got to do the rematch, and then all of a sudden it's like, yeah, we would do that GSP fight. But then if it is his thirtieth and that's the last one, you kind of you might have to pick one or the other. It's either a GSP fight or a Conor fight. I feel like the Conor fight would be bigger in terms of pay per view buys and you know connor's a bigger name and stuff i'd like to see the gsp fight just because it'd be you know interesting more than anything but do you think that h how legitimate do you think the ufc are about that or do you think it's kind of a bit of public negotiating where dane is kind of trying to say to connor like hey we have other options man like if you don't want to fight like we have another guy willing to do it and i guess the benefit of the gsp fight is uh you know if, if connor does go in there and get smashed by khabib again that's not really good for his brand, so they can still have a big fight without, you know, the need for Connor. Yeah, well, listen, uh, Dana White is is the best promoter in the history of combat sports. I can tell you this: when he says something publicly, it ain't by accident. So there's always a little bit of public negotiation in there. You know what I mean? Um, but that said, I think you're right. I mean, listen, is Dana right that Connor Habib, you know, two would be the biggest fight in the history? Absolutely, man. It would be massive. These two guys are are, are, are global superstars, um, so that they, they they you know appeal to more markets all over the world and of course there's no denying it man conor mcgregor is the biggest star in the history of the sport man he moves the needle like nobody else so pay-per-view wise you're absolutely right it would be a financial home run but if a b gets to 29 and 0 
man, just knowing who he is and what he wants to accomplish, I think he want. I mean, he he would much prefer that GSP fight. If they said, look, you're going to make half the money if you do GSP, but we'll do it for you. Guarantee you, Habib says, that's fine. Half the money's all right with me. Let's go. Um, and, and you think about what that would mean in terms of, you know, all-time greats. I mean, you know, at worst, GSP is what, top three at worst in, in, in terms of all-time greats? Um, and, and, you know, Habib is obviously getting right there as well. And so, you know, to have that that potential to go 30-0 and 0, uh, and to do it against uh, a fellow all-time pound-for-pound great, I mean, you think about what that would mean uh, to, to Habib's career and his legacy. I think that would mean far more to him um, than, than a couple extra million dollars that he would make fighting Conor McGregor. So um, I, I think I think Habib would, would want want that fight but but we'll see i mean again you know gsp has said he can get to 155 can he i don't know he says it's not an issue um and and, and to be honest i i you know it's kind of most interesting to me at 155 i, I think mm, um because if yeah. it's at 170 it's, it's not a title fight you know what i mean now uh if, if for some reason the belt was vacant and they were fighting for the i don't know it would be weird but i mean i like the belt on the line it means a lot um it, as well as their, their their legacy and you're right listen no disrespect to Conor McGregor, um, but that's a tough stylistic matchup for him. No matter how many times they fight, it's always going to be a tough fight for him. And if you're Conor, I mean, I, I, I don't know, man. I, I, I would rather take some of the other matchups that are out there on the table, if I'm, if I'm being honest. So um, I, I don't have a lot of hope for that fight happening. I, I, I really don't. Um, it would be big, and there's a reason Dana mentioned it. It's something that they'd love to do because it would be absolutely massive in terms of financial gain. Uh, but I, I just I don't really see it happening. And also, what a great legacy GSP has. One of the only guys to leave the game on top and not stick around too long. And then he comes back at a lower weight class. At an older age, close to 40, or maybe he'll be 40 by the time it happens. It would just be sad to see a lesser version of the GSP that we all you know, but, n- n- know and love. But how amazing would it be if he came back and he, he puts the one on that record in Habib's record? I mean, at that point, don't <laughs> talk to me about it. At that point, don't talk to me about John Jones. Don't talk to me about Dimitri Johnson. GSP would be the, the hands-down goat in my mind to come back after four years and take the middleweight belt off of Michael Bisping, to come back after another four years and put the one on Habib's record and take the lightweight belt, become the first three-division champion. Stop it. Discussion's <laughs> over. GSP, you know? Mm. You said Dana White's the greatest promoter in MMA history, but I really yeah. think it's John Morgan. Let me, let's me let quickly talk about the fights this weekend, and we'll let you go. We really appreciate the time. Chris Weidman is making his return to the middleweight division. He takes on Amari Akhmedov. What are you expecting from Weidman here, John? Because, you know, he hasn't looked the best in his last few fights. A lot of people are a little bit worried about him and the damage that he's been taking. Could we potentially, do you think, be looking at his final fight if it's another tough, tough loss this weekend? I would think so, man. I, I hate to say that. You know, this is a, a guy that, man, such a part of MMA history with the series with Anderson Silva. Uh, and, man, and I'll, I just, I'll never forget, man, the confidence that that guy carried in himself as he was making his way to the mm. top. I remember he was a guest fighter in Brazil um, and, 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 you know, having a couple conversations with him while he was there, just talking about how he was going to beat Anderson Silva. And, and, and it, was, it was one of those things I always say, you can tell when somebody has real self-belief um, and when they're trying to hype themselves up to make themselves believe it. And he had that real self-belief, man. And, and it, it, amazing. I mean, those two fights were uh, were, were crazy. I mean, they're, they're both ending in wild ways. So, you know, the last thing I want to do is run the guy out of the sport, man. He's a great dude. Uh, you know, and, and again, a, a part of MMA history for sure. Um, but, yeah, man, he's taken some damage and, you know, dealt with some injuries. And, um, you know, uh, you know, this is the type of fighter he should be able to beat. You know what I mean? Let's, it's one thing if you're always facing – champions and former champions and you're coming up a little bit short and you go wow man i got four losses in a row but yeah but those four losses are the number one two three and four in the world you know what i mean like that's 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 different but this is a fight he should win and so um i feel like this is very much a a crossroads fight for for chris weidman because i don't think he's the type of guy that just wants to hang around and fight just to fight you know what i mean i think he believes in himself and believes that he's an elite level fighter and deserves to be in those top level competitions so if if he comes up short here i mean sure if there's financial opportunities on the table to take more fights and you know kind of build his bankroll and, so, and support his family's future um he could but i just don't think that that's the kind of fighter he is so um i think this is a very very important moment in, in chris weidman's career and i'm anxious to see um kind of kind of what version of him we see man especially considering you know we all know how difficult it is for everybody prepared during this time and um 
I, I don't know, man. I'm, I'm, I'm anxious to see him, to say the least. Mm, the stakes are definitely high for this one. Uh, also, last question, and then we'll let you go, John. Obviously, the main event between Derek Lewis and Alexei Olenek. Uh, it's just an interesting one. This is kind of like a, an old-school throwback one, like very much grappler versus striker. We know that Derek Lewis wants to get in there and just, you know, beat a guy and then go home and eat some ass, and then uh, Olenek just wants to uh, <laughs> go in there and, and, and smother him in a, in a different kind of way, you know? Uh, a way that Derek probably isn't necessarily uh, fond of or, or used to. But, um, and I'll never forget Alexi Olenek. He, he's a fun guy to watch and he's kind of underrated. I love it, UFC 246 post fight where he's doing the media scrum and he just yells out to one of the PR people, just like, hey, you, go over there. Or, so, or whatever he said. He just basically <laughs> finished his own post fight. Like, uh, enough. It's like Brock Lesnar at UFC 200, but this time it's Alexi Olenek. He's calling the shots. So how do, how do you see this fight playing out? Obviously, the question with Derek Lewis is always the back. Those back problems have sort of, you know, come and gone throughout his whole career. And you got to think with ISO, maybe not getting the best training, maybe wanting to eat a little bit extra during ISO. Uh, you know, the worries of the weight and the back problems, all this kind of stuff comes back. How do you see this one uh, playing out? Love this fight, man. I really do. As you said, it's, it feels old school, right? I mean, it is mm. striker versus grappler. Alexi Olenek. I tell you, I, I love Alexi too. It, it, but we don't get to really do the big weigh-ins anymore. But there are so many times he would get on stage and he would just stand there. It's like, dude, you've had like 60 fights. You don't know you're supposed to stand on the scale right now. It's just hilarious, man. But, man, you talk to people that he trains with and they'll tell you, man, the squeeze that he has, it's just it's otherworldly, man. The grip strength and the power that he has, it's, it's just absolutely otherworldly. Um, you know, we'll be competing in, in, in the smaller cage, obviously, here, man. When you talk about heavyweights in that smaller cage, man, they, they do, there is no room to, 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 to go anywhere. So Derek Lewis is going to have to be very, very careful because he does not want to be anywhere on the ground. I know that, you know, Derek is, is one of those guys that, uh, you know, he just basically turns over and stands up against a lot of people, right? Yeah. Like, I don't think that's an option here, man. I, I think you do that thing where you just post and stand uh something on your body is getting taken whether it's the neck and arm a leg uh olenek's got it all in there i know we talked about the ezekiel choke but he's got it all in his bag so uh, i think derek's gonna have to be very mobile um and be very very careful he doesn't want to uh, play uh, on the ground at all that said um i like lewis's opportunities here at the same time olenek is uh not exactly you know the, the most mobile guy himself you know what i mean i think he's there to take shots so um i, I favored derek lewis in this fight uh i i think he can land something big this is not somebody that's gonna show a lot of head movement and, and, and make you chase him down and and uh you know be difficult to find and try to try to you know jab and move jab and move that's not what we're gonna see here so because of that um i think olenek's game does play into uh lewis's strengths as long as he keeps it on the feet but i'm telling you uh he does not want to play around at all on the ground or, or bad things will happen so i like lewis in this fight but Olenek, always uh, a live underdog, man. His, his grappling game is, is off the charts. Mm, Going to be interesting. Uh, both men on uh, two-fight win streaks. One guy will walk away with a three-fight win streak. A good position to be in in the company right now. John, we appreciate you jumping on from the uh, hotel over there. We wish you all the best, guys. Make sure to follow John at MMA Junkie John on Twitter and check out the MMA Roadshow, the place to go for all the hot goss during fight week. John, we can't wait to see what happens next. Make sure not to yell at Herb Dean for us. <laughs> I know you want me to yell. I'll let him know it's from you. <laughs> Kick his ass, see bass. Thanks so much, Joe. We appreciate having you on the program. See you guys. Thanks, John. Bye.